be a uh, doctoral candidate and Aboriginal pre-doctoral fellow in the School of Social Work, uh, as well as assistant professor in the Department of Health and Aging and Society here at the University of uh, Randy's research interests include the study of the ways indigenous forms of knowledge can be used in health research with a particular focus on the experience of HIV among Aboriginal people living with or at risk of infection. His most recent research has appeared in the Journal of HIV, AIDS and Social Services, the Canadian Journal of Community Mental Health and Qualitative Health Research. Uh, the title of his talk today, Exploring Resiliency and Wellness Among Two-Spirit Men Living with HIV in Ontario. Um, after the um, presentation, I'm hoping we will have uh, time for questions. Um, so if you do have any questions, please uh, hang on to them and uh, offer them up uh, after the talk is done. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Appreciate making the effort. Okay, so I just want to start by uh, acknowledging our funding source, which was the Canadian Institute of Health Research. It was a catalyst grant, a one-year catalyst grant, which finishes um, finished at the end of uh, this, just the end of this past uh, March. Uh, members of the research team, including David Brennan, who's our, our, our PI on the project, Art Zolkol, who's a principal knowledge user, and Tony Novus, who's a co-investigator along with myself. And uh, Art and Tony are both uh, represent the, the two spirit people of the First Nations and organization in Toronto. And then our research staff, Earl Naujizik, um, and Shabiza Brett, and George, George Ispesky, I think is how you pronounce his last name. And then also members of our advisory committee, which are OHAS, um, the Nine Circles Community Health Clinic in, in Winnipeg, um, Toronto Aboriginal Care Team, and the Union of Ontario Indians HIV AIDS Program. So just to, just by way of background, I just wanted to put some some statistics on, on for you about how Aboriginal people are represented in the HIV epidemic in Canada. Although we count for 3.8 percent of the Canadian population, um, we're, it's estimated that 4,300 to 6,100 Aboriginal people are living with HIV in Canada in 2000 at the end of 2008. This represents about 8% of all prevalent HIV infections in Canada. Now, that, that, those, those stats are further, um, you can further talk about them in ways in which, um, for example, youth are overrepresented in, in the HIV uh, epidemic in Canada. So Aboriginal youth are 32.6% 30, compared to non-Aboriginal youth at 20.5. Women are, are also overrepresented in the HIV epidemic, so that's about just slightly under 50% compared to non-Aboriginal people at 20%. And injection drug use is an important risk factor for acquisition of HIV infection among Aboriginal people at about 66% of all HIV infections in the Aboriginal community are attributed to injection drug use. Aboriginal people are also likely to have a later diagnosis compared to non-Aboriginal people. There's a slower uptake of antiretroviral treatments, and there's less access to experienced uh, physicians, which results in higher morbidity or illness and sickness, shorter survival times, and a mortality rate that is approximately three times higher than for non-Aboriginal people. Two-spirit men represent a distinct population within this whole picture. So they represent about 20% of all HIV, all new HIV infections at the end of 2008. Um, injection drug use is, a, is an important risk factor for two-spirit men compared to non-Aboriginal people. And about 72% of all Aboriginal people living with HIV have, are living with, are currently living with an AIDS diagnosis, so more advanced sort of illness. Um, the project really grew out of this uh, community identified concern about how best to, um, to deliver services that support um, two spirit resiliency. Um, um, they noticed that even though painted a fairly bleak picture here, a number of two-spirit men that they provide services to are actually faring very well. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, 
there's also this important, the intersections of racism, colonial, colonization, and homo, homophobia represent sort of distinct issues that are confronted by, by two-spirit people. Another reason why the study was, was, was promoted was this, um, was, um, was a past, past project they worked on, the two-spirit organization, leading an extraordinary life. And uh, what, what, this, uh, what this project was really about was about HIV prevention and about barriers to, or overcoming barriers to HIV prevention. Some of them identified were homophobia, um, access to care that supported individual self-worth, and inclusion of, um, of uh, or attention to relationships to spirit men have with, uh, with their families and spiritual connections. And uh, we knew as researchers that there's there's a very there's a lack of information about about resiliencies, strength, and assets of two spirit men. And so we wanted to explore this a bit further through this study. So what do I mean by two spirit? Two spirit men refers to uh, both men and women who self-identify as possessing both male and female attributes. And what this really means is that, is that, is that two-spirit people often talk about how, how they possess the spirits of both masculine and feminine qualities, and that they live between these gendered experiences or roles, um, and that's embedded in sort of cultural roles, such as they're, they're often referred to themselves as seers, visionaries, or healers. It's important to note that that um, the majority of two spirit people identify as, as 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 gay, lesbian, or bisexual. But two spirit is not really about sexual orientations; it's more a gender designation, a third gender designation. So, as I said earlier, this paints a sort of, sort of an only partial picture of what's happening among two spirit men. Um, it paints a picture that of suffering and dysfunction, which justify um, um, responses around around uh, around uh, helping or control, um, and contributes also to the construction of Aboriginal identity that shapes responses to HIV infection in those communities. So there was a need for this research, as I also said. Um, the anecdotal evidence were based on the three decades of community experience where this population was actually fearing well, and little or no literature around resiliency, strengths, assets of two-spirit men living with HIV, and ways that this can be used to support community efforts. So the goals of, of our Catalyst grant was to better understand the factors, skills, resources, knowledge, and practices that contribute to two-spirit men, men's health and well-being living with HIV. Um, so what we set out to do was, was, was to comprehensively review the literature. We were going to conduct a, a, a series of focus groups related to um, two-spirit resiliency with two-spirit men. Um, we wanted to further develop our community academic partnerships, and we wanted to utilize the results of all this to build a larger study focus on, on the same area. So I'm going to talk first about, about the focus group component here, and then I'm going to move on. But the focus groups for us became in sharing circles, and this was a result of our literature review, which, um, which talked about how focus groups are best conceptualized as sharing circles. Um, so our focus groups were, are being mod moderated by a two-spirit man living with HIV and a traditional helper. And it's about really using traditional or ancestral knowledge um, to reflect oral culture, the importance of oral culture in Aboriginal communities. So this is a symbol-based inquiry. So we used an Ojibwe medicine wheel um, to stimulate dialogue about strengths and assets with the men who were coming into the focus groups. So we have six uh, sharing circles planned. One of them is complete, it was in Toronto last weekend. Um, but we expect a total of approximately 48 participants to be involved. And this, the plans for this were reviewed by, um, by the Ethics Review Boards at both the University of Toronto and McMaster University. So 
and then we have the community academic and future research plan area. And so what we did was, we, as I said, we involved a number of local Aboriginal and Ontario-based organizations to provide guidance and feedback on our research design. Um, we also um, work, our local works very closely with the International Indigenous Working Group on HIV and AIDS. Their mandate is to strengthen collaboration and partnerships internationally with Indigenous people confronting HIV. Um, one of their one of the, this working group's major activities is every two years they plan an Indigenous pre-conference to the International AIDS Conferences. Um, last year it was in Washington, D.C. and Arts Oakle made a presentation at, at that pre-conference um, to gauge interest and possibly build this international collaboration and a larger international study. So we're currently exploring um, funding opportunities for national and international work and we had um, um, discussions with both academics and community in the United States, New Zealand, Australia, Peru and Chile. So if the funding rolls out we'll be actually doing a, a much larger study in the future. So our literature ready, which is now where I want to shift the focus and spend a, a bit more time on this. Um, used um, Arnsky's and O'Malley's uh, scoping review process. It's a sort of a six-step process where we refine our research question and, um, and, and around, around a scoping review and relate that to our research questions. We search for relevant studies across the, the various databases, um, ensuring breadth and comprehensiveness. Um, we selected appropriate studies for inclusion into the scoping review. We charted the data using Excel and in terms of a comparative analysis. And we collated and summarized results using NVivo for a, a thematic analysis, so looking across the literature to, um, to what themes were being expressed. And of course, stakeholder consultation. Part of that stakeholder consultation for us as well involved uh, consulting with other um, other researchers who are working in the area of Two Spirit Health um, on this, uh, asking them whether or not our, our our research design was appropriate, whether or not we were finding the right kinds of literature, that type of thing. So our search terms were fairly comprehensive. So we looked at the literature in terms of orientation, um, sort of the left-hand column. Um, Aboriginal people um, was another uh, search term that we used. Um, so for example, um, we also decided as we were looking through the literature that there were a number of, of uh, sort of indigenous languages being represented here and so we included those also in this list as well the condition which was HIV or AIDS, and then the, the, the ideas around resiliency, coping, protective factors or processes, well-being, optimal health, strength, wellness, those kinds of things would help us to find literature in those various areas. So once we, we, we scope the literature, we asked a series of questions about each of the abstracts that we were reading. And I'll go into a bit more detail later, but, but um, we asked whether or not the article was focused on, in any way, on Aboriginal people or Indigenous people, whether or not the article addressed two-spirit gay, bisexual, or transgender issues. Does some of the component of the article address the intersection of living with HIV for more than two years? And is resiliency in its broadest form addressed in some way in the article? And that helped us to, to, um, to determine um, what articles we were going to include in the study. So these are the 12 databases that we accessed. Um, and you can see the numbers in the right-hand column. Um, related to each each electronic database. Um, and we pulled, uh, initially pulled a 15, slightly under 16,000 
um, abstracts. Um, once we removed duplicates, we were down to a total of uh, about 86, 8600. And, um, and each of those 8600 are, are abstracts were read by at least two reviewers. There was, a, there was agreement, um, it stayed in. If there was disagreement, a third reader came in and read it and made the deciding vote. And, um, and, and anyways, we, we removed, once we did that, we, we removed another 7,110, 109, sorry. Um, and we were down to about 43 journal articles that focused on this area. It was a long process. It took us about a year to do that. Um, um, we have now pulled all of those 43, um, and we're currently reading them, constructing a coding, a coding code book. Um, and so uh, as we read them, we realize that some of those 43 aren't quite focused on our research question. So we're, so we're now down to, I think we've removed another five or six journal articles from that 43, so we're down to about 37 at the moment. We, I expect that, having read most of the articles now, that, that, that we'll further, further remove uh, a substantial proportion of that 43. So just some preliminary findings, or just what, what I've noticed as I've been reading and constructing this code book and, and using it and people to do this. Um, that context is an extremely important component to understanding resiliency among two-spirit men. Um, now, resiliency is defined as the ability to do well despite adversity and refers to specific traits or characteristics of individuals. And that's met with some criticism in the literature because it uh, it puts the, the uh, the onus on the individual to do well rather than looking more concretely at structural risks. And so the literature that we're seeing um, is focused on, is also focused on highlighting the structural risks that exist in the context of resiliency. So in the context of Two Spirit Man, this is about historical and intergenerational trauma and continuing colonialism. It's also about some of the social determinants of health, such as poverty, education, employment or underemployment, homelessness, housing, um, that type of thing. And then also about a lack of access to culturally appropriate education, prevention and health services. So um, there's really this inattention to indigenous models of health and well-being in the context of service delivery. The second the second, or some of the other factors that we've noticed is this idea of multiple minority status. So there, there were two articles in the 43 that I talked about earlier that, um, that recognize that, that indigenous people, indigenous two-spirit men particularly, um, have multiple minority statuses that, uh, such as indigenous, HIV positive, gay, that type of thing and that that has a compounding effect in terms of whether or not they're able to be uh, resilient. Um, mental health status also shapes resilience. Um, so depression and other mental health illnesses such as anxiety um, and also substance use. There were about four articles um, that also explored past and current sexual abuse um, in the context of, uh, excuse me, in the context of resilience and also street or sex work and street involvement, which shapes whether or not somebody's able to be resilient. There were also this, this um, two articles that talked about sort of these rural urban issues. So in there, there's this recognition that there's increasing rates of infection among male and minority populations in rural communities. And this is linked to um, rural urban migration patterns. So people leave rural areas to explore sexuality and create a sense of community related to their two-spirit identities. They often encounter racism, discrimination, those kinds of things in the context of an urban environment um, where they're away from, from their sort of Aboriginal uh, families and communities, that type of thing. Um, sometimes they become, when they become a 
when they become HIV positive, and as health status declines, there's this migration back to their urban or rural communities to to um, to get support from their families and communities. Um, it's been noted by these two studies that rural health care services inadequately respond to this demand once there's this return to rural communities. It's a result of AIDS phobia, homophobic attitudes, lack of expertise related to HIV care, geographic barriers, lack of resources, climate of decreasing support, and lack of case management approaches. Um, leads to isolation, social isolation, and linked with an accelerated course of HIV. So there's this, there's this argument about increasing the strength of rural services is essential to foster resilience in coping. Other strategies that, that the literature identifies that individuals use are the use of group and individual therapeutic strategies. Three articles talked about that. The role of social support from family, friends, and community, three articles. And um, using cultural resources was another um, approach that was discussed by one article and how it shapes resilient res responses. Um, so individuals tend to use sort of sweat lodges, talking circles, that type of thing that sort of support their self-identity in the context of living with HIV. Um, cultural competence was a, a fairly large issue in, in the literature that we consulted. So about seven articles focused on cultural competence. So this is about a holistic model of care grounded in cultural values and perspectives. Um, there's an acknowledgement that it needs to be comprehensive. Um, so individual group counseling, case management, prevention counseling, psychosocial assessment, cultural identities, healing practices, and spirituality. And indigenous organizations were often talked about as best suited to provide this kind of care that really supports principles of self-determination. There was overlap with another body of literature around, um, so 21 articles talked about, about the need for culturally grounded, comprehensive, and targeted interventions. So in terms of research design of the, of the 43 or 37 or whatever, yeah, um, articles that we talked, we even consulted, only one article talked about the need for decolonizing and indigenous methodologies. So there is this argument about the need to understand and respond to risk and resilience through an indigenous lens. Um, a number of the studies of the 40, 40, roughly 40 studies that we, we, are, we consulted were qualitative in, or yeah, qualitative in nature. Sorry, I flipped that around. Um, so using a focus groups and depth interviews, that type of thing, and then qualitative or quantitative, which is a survey and needs essentially lesser amount of the studies use that approach. Um, there were four articles that, that used a mix method approach, so combining in some way survey and interviews, that type of thing. And then one of one of the articles was a sort of a conceptual argument about, but how do we theorize to spirit health? One of the things that that article talked about was an indigenous stress coping model, which potentially is useful for us as we move forward. And that's really about about sort of risk, cultural resources, and how that sort of mediates the risk that's encountered, and how it leads to. Um, if, it's, if the cultural resources are there, it mediates sort of health outcomes at the end. If, it's not, if the, the cultural resource is not there, then the, uh, the, uh, the health outcome at the end of it is, 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 is less than what one would expect. So um, in, in total, two-spirit health was not adequately studied in the literature. Um, there was only one comprehensive review theorizing to spirit health, and there were few, if any, empirical studies exploring risk factors, disparities in health, and resiliency among two spirit people. There's a need to increase the visibility of two spirit concerns in research, and to conduct um, empirical studies, 
using a decolonizing research strategy with indigenous knowledge. So foregrounding um, contexts such as historical trauma, using indigenous methodologies or hybridized methods um, in ways that, that not only uh, support the idea of strength, but also in the context of risk for challenges that are being lived by two-spirit men. Um, and there's a, one needs to approach this with the understanding that there's this justifiable sort of mistrust um, on the part of Aboriginal people um, to Western approaches, both in research and in healthcare related services. So, again, there was very little information about resiliency. We need to increase that focus need. We need to shift our perspective from deficit to strength-based perspectives. Um, it's useful for, our findings we think are probably useful for researchers interested in resiliency research among two-spirit men. It's also useful for Aboriginal communities and other organizations who wish to develop or adapt existing services. And that's it, yeah. Thank you. Um, just before we start the questions, um, I'd just like to invite you to help yourselves to um, refreshments we have there. So please, uh, please take a minute to get a cup of uh, coffee. And, uh, <laughs> okay, you can uh, oh, have questions. Oh, I have questions. Um, so I'm curious about the sharing circles. Yes. So you said that one had been done in Toronto. Yeah. So I'm wondering where the other ones are happening, what kind of the recruitment strategy is, and what the demographics of those participants look like. Yeah. Or you anticipate they might look like. Yeah. Um, so there are six focus groups. Two of them are, are in Toronto. And then we have uh, Tor or London, mm -hmm. Thunder Bay, North Bay, Sudbury, and Ottawa, I believe. I think that's six, right? Yeah, and uh, the demographic uh, are, I think, largely people who have been living with HIV for, for at least the ones in Toronto, so they've been living with HIV for uh, a significant period of time, like 10 years plus. Um, um, yeah, and the age, age older, so over 40, I think, is, is where it was as well. And that's, I think we can anticipate that in other settings as well, from what we know about the population already. Randy, can I um, go back to your um, search terms, um, where you had the, um, the approach, the, the, the terminology that you searched for for approach. Yeah. Um, the thing that struck me was that the, the terms that you looked for um, imply at best a kind of neutralization of the health condition. Um, and it, it struck me that when we think of other health conditions like cancer, right. um, the language that people use is often a lot more active and antagonistic than coping. We talk about fighting, battling, you know, confronting, right. uh, combating the war against cancer and so on. And I wonder, is that language, that more kind of antagonistic language, used metaphorically obviously, yeah, but yeah. is that just simply something that's not used uh, in conjunction with HIV? Oh, I think it's used. I mean, Susan Sontag wrote uh, uh, back in the day, right? Yeah, her book on cancer, yeah. Yeah, she also uh, talked about HIV, I believe, in okay. the second, maybe it is the second edition of that mm -hmm. book or something that was similar to it. So, yeah, um, yeah it's... it's. A but I wonder why you, you wouldn't have looked for those search terms as well. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, no. We, we would think that if we were looking for terms around like the war on HIV or you know mm -hmm. the battles or you know those kinds of words, that it would have been it would have came up as we search for HIV AIDS as well, mm -hmm. right? So they would have been assumed under those. Yeah. Those so that words. language just doesn't seem to be used in the in the literature. Yeah, it does. It actually is. Do you have any thoughts of why that might be the case? Um, No, I, I just wondered. I, I, you know. I haven't actually thought thought about that, mm -hmm. but it, it's an interesting point. Often you hear about about um, the war on HIV, mm -hmm. you know, 
or, or battling HIV or you know um, those kinds of words are used quite quite a lot I think in the literature. Um, I wonder if they come from a more health science perspective of it, like therapies around it, as opposed to more of the qualitative kinds of things you were looking at. So maybe those words didn't come out in. Yeah. No, I think if you look at cancer, I mean, part yeah. of the part of the, the shift in the language around cancer was this idea of people aren't just victims, right. but the idea of agency, you know, that, yeah. that people who have the condition don't just sort of sit back and wait to die, right? right. They, they actively get out there and fight this, this condition, at least, yeah. or, or at least in terms of overcoming the symptoms that they have to live with. Right. And, and, and we've, had, we've seen the same thing with HIV, right, the shift from, you know, the language of affliction uh, to the language of, um, of living, living, living with, yeah. right? Yeah. Not dying from, but living with. But it would seem then that that would lend itself to that shift in to a more kind of active, even combative sort of yeah. language of metaphors. You know, yeah. Kind of point. yeah. That's, a, I think, an interesting point and something that that perhaps we can explore. And, and I think, it, you know, at least in the, in the focus group we had in Toronto last weekend, mm -hmm. I think that those ideas are coming out. In, yeah, did, did, did people that, use that in the, in the focus groups? Is that yeah, kind of yeah. language? I wonder if, I mean, when I, that, uh, that's a really interesting point, but my, my visceral response to that is that maybe uh, cancer and HIV are not equally situated. So it seems historically as though people have fought people with AIDS as opposed to people rallying in support of people who have mm -hmm. cancer. Although I think so I, Sontag makes the point, you know, that yeah, early on that cancer Sontag. was seen as a stigmatizing disease, right? Yeah. Um, you know, certain, particularly certain forms like breast cancer, right? That they had carried a very strong sort of stigma with it, um, and that part of the struggle around agency to appropriate agency was was the struggle against those kinds of prevalent <coughs> social, you know, those sort of prejudices sort that of people had. Sort of belief or knowledge around, right? Yeah. Sort of stigmatizing attitudes, which also shape discrimination. Yeah. Right. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're right. It probably was but not as it was it this. was not as strong. I don't think as in the case of HIV. Um, and you know, so maybe, really, in a sense, the struggle of the language is that you don't you don't try to sort of swing right to the opposite. You just try to kind of achieve a neutral ground. In the middle. Right. No, you're right. I mean, just they're, they're, a thought. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching it from a non-indigenous perspective. I, I don't know what the language, the sort of mm -hmm. um, sports metaphors or militaristic language, how they resonate within an indigenous context. If yeah. it might have a different, um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And maybe I'm just reacting as a, a someone who's gendered female, where I think, oh, I don't like the language of. Mm -hmm. What's not, what feels militaristic and the sports analogies that get taken up with battling, challenging, fighting. Um, yeah. yeah, that seems to resonate with me, what you're saying as well. Yeah, the, the militaristic kinds of analogies, you know, typically, I don't think you really typically hear them in Aboriginal circles the way you would hear them sort of in sort of mainstream HIV worlds. No, I just was following from your point. Um, if you do look at sort of the political dimension of it, or I, I, I would view the challenge or fight in a political dimension, right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying we're not going to accept the status quo. If you were looking at that, would you also maybe discover that activism is a form of resiliency, or builds resiliency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and interestingly, we don't see that in the literature. Yeah. Yeah. Or I haven't seen it yet, anyway. Yeah, but for sure, I, I think that, you know, that you're on something. I think, you know, part of the ramping up of the rhetoric is is you know is 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 driven politically right as a way of trying to you know focus uh, the public spotlight the media spotlight policymakers' interests on 
a particular health condition, right? I mean, in the end, you know, the advocates for indif different conditions are all competing for, for, for money out there, you know, for research or for um, treatment or whatever. Uh, and so you, I think you tend to find that the ramping up of the language often comes as a result of thinking, you know, feeling or, or, or knowing that your, your issue is sort of fading in the spotlight of attention, right? So it's often used, the rhetoric is often related there to the kind of political struggle that you're in to, to ensure that people still are paying attention to this issue, you know, and, and, still, and, and the governments are still going to fund research and, and, and treatment and so on, you know. And I think that there's always, um, there seems to be this sort of um, morality kind of comes into it, where I think that there's often an assumption that um, HIV AIDS is sort of a moral weakness, like it was your fault that you got this, and I think increasingly we're seeing that when we talk about cancer too, where it's like, oh well, you're eating bad diet, you're eating mm -hmm. too many pesticides, you make poor choices, yeah. you drank too much, yeah. you smoked, um, and so I mean, I think that as soon as this sort of moral dimension gets added into it, it becomes like, I mean, it's, it's an external thing, but I think that there really is still this lingering, well, you got HIV, mm. it's not that you did, your fault, therefore, um, this is your thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. It's implicit in the whole notion of lifestyle diseases. Yeah. And once you call something a lifestyle disease, you're individualizing people's responsibility. Exactly. exactly. And I mean, before you knew that tobacco causes cancer, mm -hmm. I mean, this is just a poor thing that afflicts people for no reason. And then all of a sudden now, it just seems like more and more and more health conditions are being sort of talked about the way HIV AIDS is as a part of this. So, I think 
there's a number of people who talk in that way as well across sort of research projects I've been involved in as well. So. And is that also taking being taken up by therapists, healthcare providers? The reason I ask is I um, have my, an adult child who works in Vancouver in an Aboriginal health and wellness setting, and okay. it's not necessarily taken up in the same way by the counselors. It's a it, it's an aha moment when it get when it's raised, but it's quite inconsistent. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 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 And services, it's. How do you embed that in the service, right, is I think part of the challenge. Another challenge is related to sort of the financial piece of round. How do you create sort of a targeted intervention um, in ways that, 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 don't, that don't cause an enormous amount of money, right? So there's, um, there's that challenge. It's hard to target services in the context of fiscal kinds of constraints, right? Because then that what I would be one just in the Aboriginal community, I would be one for women, one for youth, one for older people, one for two spirit men, one for straight men, you know what I mean? And then the list can go on and on and on. So even though there might be recognition that that's um, a uh, an interesting um, point, I mean it's 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 mediated by these sort of fiscal kinds of, and I'm not saying that that, that right, I'm just Correct. saying yeah, that, 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 yeah, yeah, so, anything else, or? Is two-spiritedness um, a universal indigenous thing worldwide? Like, it seems to me, okay. No, no. It, it, I think it first originated in Canada. And okay. it was taken up in the U.S. and um, and now you hear it talked about in Australia, but I think that's about the extent of it. And is it so? Like in in the context of the work that you're doing, is it always related to um, gendered experience? Because it seems like sometimes there, there's like a little bit of a slippage between like the gender piece, but then also the yeah. You know, because like if we're looking at sort of the, the orientation list here, yeah. like there's, I mean, some things that are about gender, some things that are about sexual orientation, and I just wonder how that plays yeah. out. How that plays out. Like internationally, like in a global context, if you're looking at literature yeah. from. So, so as we were doing the literature review, I think that we came up with, it was approximately about 10 additional words where a particular word was used that was grounded in that country's word that they have for what we mean by two spirit. Um, and I can't pronounce any of those words. <laughs> and uh, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna put them up, up on that, but slide of search terms that, that I didn't have room. So, anyways, there you have it. But um, but typically, what what what's recognized here is that the majority of two spirit or whatever the word is in that particular country, will identify as, as, as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. So typically there's sort of this, this the majority of people, like, like a vast majority of people, right. will identify as uh, bisexual orientation and describe themselves as two-spirit, but not all two-spirit people are gay, lesbian, right? And so we make the distinction that it's, it's, a, it's well, when we say two spirit, that we're typically talking about gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. But we also recognize that that, that might not always be the case. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? Well, thank you again very much, Ron, yeah, for a very interesting you. presentation.